shall fear no evil, O King of glory. For your rod and your staff, O God, they comfort us, King of glory. For your love surrounds us, O God. We shall fear nothing because we know that your love is greater than what we may face. Your love for us is greater than the tribulations we may face. Your love for us is greater than the challenges we may face, O God. And even though we may be faced by the darkest of situations, King of glory, we shall take confidence in your love, O God. We shall have confidence in your power, King of glory. We shall have confidence, O God, in your power to protect, in your power to shield us, O King of glory. And we thank you, Jehovah, for your faithfulness, for your love upon our lives. We thank you, King of glory. We thank you, Jehovah, Lord. We thank you, our Father. We thank you, O oh God, for your faithfulness and your goodness, O oh God. Your goodness keeps running after us, O oh King of glory. And we are here to worship you and to praise the King of glory. Thank you, Jehovah. He was trying to help us know that this guy, he was so filled with love. You know, you can't just try to bring people around, telling them, Unakumbuka, you know, about who you Christ. He was trying to bring them back to the love of God. And he was an apostle of love. And now, uh, when you read First John chapter 1, uh, from verse 3 to 4, we pro uh, I mean, let me start from uh, verse 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have had, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim 
concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with our Father, is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And his character, I mean, when I was reading this, I could see that his character is, is love, his personality, and his love for the word of God was a true indicator that indeed this guy had fellowship and had a good relationship with Christ. Now, uh, when I was reading this, I also came across uh, a story by this guy. He's called John Robert Wooden. Now, this guy was an American uh, basketball coach. They called him a uh, coach. He was, then, uh, he, was, he was nicknamed as the Wizard of the Westwood. And why he was nicknamed this is because his team uh, kept on winning. Every championship that these players would go to play, he kept on winning in a span of 12 years. Can you imagine? For 12 good years, this team, NCAA, they were, they, were, they were leading. They were the best players in the universe. And he was a good coach. Now, what were Mani Do you remember those days when <laughs> Mani used to be on top? of the table, yeah. and Alex Ferguson. Yeah. How many of us love football? Oh, Am yes. I alone? Yes, what we want just a United no, no. You know, there's a time that Manu could feed until the other players were like, where are yeah. our what? Yeah. We used to fear that team. See, really, me, 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 and there. <laughs> but we are praying for you, Manchester United fans, me being one of them. Now, these guys, they won 10 championships in a span of 12 years. Can you imagine? It's somehow weird, isn't it? Like all along. But now, uh, this reporter, this, this one reporter who, who, who decided to, to just go and face this coach, this Mr. Uh, we, I mean, Wooden, his name was Mr. Wooden. And he asked him, hey, coach, Kwani, what is the secret of the success of these guys. Yeah, you guys have been leading all along. You know, what is the secret of this success? And, and whatever he told this reporter, you, I mean, it is unbelievable. You know what he told him? That, you know what? That before every practice, I take 30 minutes to help these players by teaching them how to wear shoes and socks. Does it make sense? I mean, when we were growing up, we, we've been taught by our parents how to wear our shoes, right? And socks. Sidi kufatu, na kufunga kamba na unatembea. Sidiyo, is it hard to, to just wear your shoes and just go where you want to go? But you were taught, right? Yes. He took 30 minutes. You can imagine how wearing shoes is fast. You can just take a second. But this guy took 30 minutes of his time to teach these players on how to wear their socks. Now that is amazing. And uh, Wooden, Mr. Wooden, this coach believed that he had to go back to the basics, to the foundation. Now when I was reading this, I was like, oh, wearing shoes. This proverb yata vizuri. Maybe kiatu inazalifinya uku. Then I put up some blisters and some sores. It can even hurt me. And I was thinking, hmm, that is the reason as to why this guy was telling these guys to, I mean, this wooden to tell him. Probably, if they did not have shoes, you, you, you've seen the way, um, how many of us have ever been into a basketball playing field? Sometimes it is slippery, okay? In some other areas, it is very rough. So, my thinking was, if these guys did not wear their shoes right, maybe they would have gotten those sores and those blisters, and this would lead not to the success of, of them winning. Cindy, maybe some of them could even fall and hurt themselves. Now, we're talking. 
Wacha tuendelee tu na game. But these guys were taught on how to wear their shoes well and appropriately. Now, I was relating this with Apostle John when he's trying to bring this to an, uh, I mean, to the believers for them to have an understanding. Now, when he was writing this episode of First John, he understood the importance of going back to the basics. And we saw that in um, verse 3, that we proclaim to you that what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. Now, we could not have fellowship with these people unless they understood about the foundation. And that is love. Now, for Apostle John to have fellowship with these believers, he needed them to teach, he needed to teach them how to wear their socks and their shoes appropriately so that they don't get sores and blisters in their work of faith, in their work of salvation. And by wearing shoes and socks, I mean reading and studying the word of God. Going back to the basics. This, the word of life. He had to teach them first to understand so that they can have fellowship with God. Now, when you read this uh, uh, episode of 1 John, you will have to have the mind uh, of 1 John, I mean of John, the gospel of John. John 1.1 1, 1 says, what does it say? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was? Was God. Look at what he says in uh, 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning. What was from the beginning? Word. The word. The word of life. The word of light. And John points us back to the beginning. He's going all the way back to the dawn of creation. To the word of life. To the word of light. You know? And he's also pointing these guys back to the beginning of his own experience with Christ, with walking with Christ. When uh, Mike was, was preaching on Sunday, he mentioned that this guy was in fellowship with God. He was walking with God for a period of over three years. Can you imagine? So he, he knew, he saw, he saw Jesus healing people. He saw Jesus um, doing miracles. He was with him, and so he understood the foundation. He understood the basics of the word of life. Now he's reminding them of how he's passing onto them a message that he had that he had experienced firsthand. And this is the gospel, the word of life. And he is testifying to it. You know, you can't just give a testimony if you've not been there, if you've not gone through something. See, Neil, when God heals you, you've been having this disease, you just come and testify to people, you know, you have experienced it. And so for John, he had experienced his walk with Christ. And that's why he was trying to tell these people about the love of God, about the word of life, so that they don't forget about the, the gospel. Now, this is a challenge to us. And what came to my mind was, was the, the church of Berea. You know what these guys used to do? When, when Paul or any other uh, preacher would stand and teach them, they would go back to the scripture to see that whatever Wanja was speaking was in line with the word of God. And this really challenged me. That when our speakers or our pastors, when Wakisi Mama Apa, when on Sunday, when we write down whatever we learned on Sunday and we are, we are happy sharing even with our neighbors. Do we really go back to know if what John 1, 1 said was true? Do we? I want to challenge us this afternoon that whatever we learn in church, that we should apply it in our lives. We should go back and study the scriptures diligently, just like the Berea church. And with that, we will be able to understand uh, our fellowship in our relationship with Christ. Now, many of us do not understand the difference between fellowship and relationship. Now, fellowship is your current status and relationship is your permanent position. 
There's some of us here who are married. Amen. 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 Peter, mm. you are also heading there. We are also heading there. Dr. Gakunga always encourages you. <laughs> Every time he starts, and so you are also going there. Kuna siku tutasimama hapa to say, I am mad. Amen, Peter. Amen. Amen. Time is coming. Yes, fellowship is our current status, and relationship is your permanent position. Now, if you are married, for those of you who are married, let me not put myself in that position. For those of you who are married, you can be out of fellowship with your spouse. You can be out of fellowship with your spouse and still be married. Cindy, how many cases have we had about Ubangwa kind of friendship? So many cases, Cindy. But does that mean these guys are not married? Does that mean they are not married? The fellowship there I may talk out of the fellowship, have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We separate ourselves. We break the fellowship with God. Now when you become a believer of Christ, you are born again into the family of God. And the, um, and you are born again into the family of God and that can't make you unborn. You cannot be unborn. Now, when we were reading chapter 3, verse 1, and I love uh, what the worship team was, was, was singing, that we hold what a manner of love. And I did say, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Now, let's go to verse 10. In chapter 3, it says, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Now, if you are doing right, you are a child. Okay, and if you do not love your brother and your sister and, and a sister or your sister, the Bible says that you are not a child of God. And when we have the love of God in us, when we understand the love of God, then definitely. Loving people will not be an issue. Yeah. White was saying that loving people is, is, is hard. Yes, I've been there, I've been in that situation trying to love someone who no longer. So, how am I going to love this person? But if you have an understanding of the love of God, then you are able to love these people. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Are we following? Now, what is fellowship? The dictionary says that it is a friendly feeling that exists between people who have a shared interest or are doing something as a group. Now, um, and Lucy loves this word, communion. Fellowship is communion. Is another word for fellowship is communion. And uh, it describes Koinonia describes the unity of the spirit that comes from Christians, uh, shared beliefs, convictions, and behaviors. When those shared values are in place, then genuine koinonia or genuine fellowship occurs. Now, this fellowship produces our mutual cooperation in God's worship, in God's work, and in God's will being done in the world. Now, fellowship is all about love that intimacy with our God. And I gave some examples of people who have fellowship uh, with God in the Bible, the likes of Moses, Abraham, Job, Nehemiah, Daniel, David, and the list is endless. I love the example of David. 
There are so many times the word of God mentions that he was out of fellowship, but his relationship with him maintained. But he came back to the fellowship. Actually, God, uh, the word of God says that he was a man after my own heart. And now, when you fellowship with God, there are benefits. And I'm going to give three benefits when you fellowship with God. Number one, fellowship builds friendships. Fellowship builds friendships. For those who are writing, you can write Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. James 2, 23, I won't read all of them. James chapter 2, verse 23, and Proverbs 17, 17. And I'm going to dwell in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts 2, 42 says, Everything and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added their number daily, those who are being saved. Now, the early church is a very good example that we can learn from as a church, as Kalura Community Chapel. is a good example. These guys were so close that they would, like, everything they had was in common. Everything they did was in common. Now, I believe the, the reason as to why they had good, such, uh, such good relationships is because they were committed to Jesus and they were committed to one another. Now, Jesus says this in John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants because a uh, servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father I have made known to you. Now, if you want to build good uh, friendships in church, eh, then you will need to get involved in the ministries of this church, the activities. Men, there's a men ministry that is happening in this church. Are you part of them? Young people, there's a youth ministry in this church. Are you part of them? Women as well, children as well. We need to have fellowship in these uh, ministries that are in church. And you need to start building fellowship with one another. And networking. You know there are so many resources here. We have teachers, we have lawyers, you know. But if we network, we are able to have friendship. Amen? Now, you cannot expect good relationships to be built if you are not fellowshipping with other Christians. Fellowship builds friendships, but it takes time, it takes effort, and it takes energy. Now, on to the second one. Fellowship builds unity. And when we, I, I, we, we see that in the psalm of David, in Psalm 133, he says that how good it is how pleasant when God's people live together in unity. Unity is having everything in common and being of the same mind. When Mrs. Karori stands here and starts talking about the project of Agape Hall, you know, we are in the same mind. How was it that? Eh? Now Agape Hall, by the way, you know, we need to be united as a church. And, 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 and Paul emphasizes this in Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 4, he says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, if the Lord is interested in the unity of the church, then us, as believers, we should always have the same interest. We should, always, we should also uh, be interested in the unity of the church. Now, the third benefit is that fellowship builds God's kingdom. Now, if you are careful, uh, when I was reading the, 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 the scripture in Acts chapter 2 verse 47, it says that these people in, in the early church, they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. 
Please note this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. It builds the kingdom of God. Our fellowship and the relationship we have uh, with one another is a witness to the world. And a good example I will give is from our brothers and sisters, the Muslims. These people love one another. Mutu lalanja. Mutu lalanja. Even outsiders, because I've also experienced them. I mean, the love of these guys. They love you wholeheartedly. And we should also uh, copy that from them. Now, it is the same thing the early church uh, had. They had fellowship with one another. They were committed to Jesus and to one another. And the whole entire world saw it. Now, I want to encourage us that when we are having these activities, the CLGs, the youth ministries, when we are meeting to have fellowship with one another, the whole world is watching us. Amen? Yes, we are building the kingdom of God. Now, because of time, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are to love God and we are to love one another. So then, how can I respond to the love of God? How can my love life be productive to God and to others? How can you respond to the love of God? And how can you make sure that your love life is productive? And not just to God, but also to others. Number one, by abiding in Him. And we see that in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, from verse 4 to 14, and I read. John 15, 4. 14. It says, remain in me and I also, as I also remain in you. No branch can, uh, sorry, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Is not that. That apart from him, we cannot do anything. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done unto you. Let's jump to verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands. Remain in his love. I have told you this so that you, so that my joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. Lay down one's life for once, friends. And we've seen that also in 1 John 3, 16 from our memory verse. Abide in Him. Now, when you abide in Him, you will be able to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, faithfulness, Kindness, gentleness, self-control. When you abide in Him, when you have fellowship in Him, you will be able to produce the fruit of the Spirit. But when you are outside the will of God, please note that you are producing the fruit of flesh. If you are not in Him, if you have not abided yourself in Him, you are producing the fruit of flesh. But when you are in him, when you have fellowship with him, you are able to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And how do we abide in him? By studying his words, by, by studying his word, by praising and worshiping him, by praying and having even quiet times, by walking in the Spirit. May the Lord help us to abide in him. 
another way I can respond to the love of God is by always doing what is right. And we see that in uh, 1 John, 1 John chapter 2 from uh, verse 28 and 29. Doing what is right. Now, integrity is what you do behind the scenes. When you come to church here, we will see, yes, that white you are this good person, you become a different person. You are not walking right. Amen? So, when we want to respond to the word of God, to the love of God, I mean, sorry, we have to do that what is right. And in verse 7 and 10, I mean 7 to 10 uh, in chapter 3, the dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Another, another way that I can respond to the love of God is by purifying ourselves just as he is pure. And we see that in uh, verse 3 of chapter 3. And I'm almost coming to a close. Um, another, another way that I can respond to the love of God is by avoiding sin at all costs. And we see that from uh, chapter 3, from verse 4, 4 to 6, and also from verses uh, 8 to 10. From verses 8 to 10, you can just note down and then after this you can just go and read about it. But I want to insist in 3, 4. That everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Another way to respond to the uh, love of God is by loving our brothers and sisters. Not with words alone, but with our actions. When we go to verse um, 11, to 18, it's talking more of on love. For this is the message you have, you've had from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because of his, because his actions were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Now, uh, when you are a child of God, you won't do the things of the world. And the world will hate you. Actually, in my circle of friends, I have so many of them who are not born again. Yeah? And uh, they are, they are, some of them are into drunk, they are into drugs, they are into alcohol. You know, but the way we show love to them portrays what type of person you are. You know, we should love them, not with our words alone, but also with our actions. And I want to say this, that let your speech match your actions. Now, how do you tell someone who needs Unga that God will provide, yet you have that Unga in your, in your, in your, in your house? Does it even make sense? No. When they are in need, that is when we are supposed to show them the love of God. And lastly, the way we can respond to the love of God is by sacrificing all that we have for that other person. And this draws us to our memory verse this, this day. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. That this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. Now, how many of us can die for the sake of another person? Even our family members. How many of us can die for the sake of other people? And by the way, is it easy to love? It's not. But it is very easy when you understand the love of God. Now, uh, when you see a beggar 
on the street because we, we normally meet these guys around here in our routines. What, what comes into our minds when we first see these people? Definitely, these people need help. Like you want to know that you can do it. We definitely think that they need money because they have like a small bag with them and they are requesting for money. Who told you they only need money? They also need the love of God. But we approach them and tell them about the love of God, yet we call ourselves Christians. Do we even give them our time? You know, loving others is not just trading love through money, through our finances. We can love other people with our time. Amen? With our words. So please next time, when you come across these people, please love them. Even if it's just saying, hello, God loves you. That is enough. You're portraying the love of God to them. Amen? Now when you see yourself the way God sees you, then you are able to love others. You are able to see others as God's children. May the Lord help.